continue to get more and more cases. But the response to that, so, which we can get into a little bit, uh, is going to mitigate uh, how bad this is going to get and how much the peak is going to be. Yeah, so before we get into that, maybe you could just talk for a minute about uh, what are the projections that you're currently seeing? What, what do people expect in, in the United States, in Western Europe, in the countries where uh, there are currently outbreaks that are growing very quickly? Um, what can people expect in terms of how this will affect their communities, how this will grow, uh, how this will affect them? Well, first, let's see what the virus is going to do, and then you could kind of extrapolate that into what the impact would be in a country. If the virus is left to its own devices, you will see a major, major peak, which will then turn around and come on down. In China, even with their major, rather draconian efforts to contain it, they got off, I wouldn't say to a bad start, but it was a start where they were not expecting it. And it took them about two and a half months to get to the point now where there were very few cases in China. Europe, particularly Italy, is right now in the phase that they're still accelerating. So they've had a few weeks of an acceleration. They've not been able to contain it. So the same thing likely will happen somewhere around eight weeks or so until it goes down enough that you could feel you're almost out of the woods. We now are still in the escalation phase. How high that gets, Mark, and how long it's going to take to turn around is going to be very much dependent upon how successfully we do containment and mitigation, the kinds of physical separations of people that have now been part of the guidelines. It's rather disruptive of society, certainly is. It's inconvenient, but it's that kind of thing that's going to determine. So right now, if we do yeah. well and we're really successful, at a minimum, it's going to be several weeks. Yeah, well... Some of the projections that I've seen suggest that more than 50% of people might end up being exposed to this over the next year or so. Um, is, are those the projections that you're seeing, or how much do you think that that depends on how, uh, how the response goes? Well, that, that's a great question, Mark, and it really depends upon how successfully we mitigate in the sense of physical separation while the virus is essentially going free in society. Because if you can mitigate well, there, I think that 50% is a high number. In fact, even in some of the pandemics, you're down to you know, 15, 20, 25%. A number of 50, if you do nothing to mitigate it, you may get there. But if you do some of the things that we're doing right now, I doubt if it's going to be 50. You never can tell because it's a new virus, but I would be surprised if it went that high. All right. So, you know, some parts of the country now have these shelter-in-place orders or guidance. Um, what do you think is important for people to know about those? Well, the first thing when you talk about shelter-in-place is that the people who absolutely need to do that, uh, namely self-isolate according to the guidelines, which say do it for 15 days and see what happens, are the people who are most susceptible to getting seriously ill and dying. There's a great disparity among the demography of our population about who's at risk for getting into severe complications. Younger people, it isn't all or none, but for the most part, people who are young and healthy will get infected. They'll feel a, a viral illness, sort of like a flu-like illness. They won't feel well, but they likely would not need any specific medical intervention. However, very heavily weighted, towards the elderly and those who have underlying conditions, heart disease, kidney disease, lung disease, diabetes, people on chemotherapy for cancer, they are much more likely to get serious complications and the death and morbidity is very much heavily weighted to them. So if you're gonna do anyone that needs to self-isolate, it's the people who are in the risk category. Regarding the younger people, asking people not necessarily to shelter in place, but to avoid crowds. Don't go to restaurants or bars or places where there are a lot of crowds. If you're in an area and it's disparate, I mean, the country isn't homogeneous with regard to the outbreak, but if you're in an area where there's community spread, like there has been in Washington State and in some places in New York, then many people 
should be thinking about the possibility of essentially hunkering down for a while. But the ones that always should do it are the, those who are vulnerable, the elderly, and those with underlying conditions. Okay, well, some of the questions that have come on the thread and, and in my comments before were about, well, if, if young people uh, have better health outcomes when they get this, um, can you talk for a minute about why is it so important that they take this seriously too? Uh, and, and, and how should they act to make sure that they can keep their families and, and the people that they love safe? Well, Mark, that's the prevailing question. And it's a great question that's a logical question that people ask. The fact is that even though young people will unlikely as a group, with some exceptions, but as a group, will not get seriously ill from this, they will and can and will get infected. And what happens, even though they may be minimal symptoms or no symptoms at all, they become the vector to infecting those people who are vulnerable, who can get in trouble. So it really is one of those things, Mark, where we're all in it together. Even though individuals who are young feel that they're somewhat invulnerable, I certainly felt that way when I was very young, you may be invulnerable to serious things. No one is invulnerable completely, but it's less likely that you'll get seriously ill, but you have a responsibility, not only to yourself, but to society in general, particularly the vulnerable people. Yeah, so some other questions that, that we're getting in the comments are, and there are questions from people who, uh, one person, Joseph, says, we live in Florida, um, and there are some people here who believe that hot, humid weather uh, will kill the virus, so you know, with the implication that it might not affect them and they may not need to take some of this guidance in, serious, uh, this guidance in, in order seriously. Um, you know, what's, the, the, what's the latest uh, scientific thinking on that, and how should people who have that question uh, respond? Oh, okay, it's a good question. I'll try to make it as succinct as possible. Putting coronavirus aside, in general, respiratory illnesses such as influenza and the relatively benign common cold viruses tend to do very well in cold, dry weather, and when warm, moist weather comes, People go outside, they're not congregated indoors, and viruses generally like cold, dry weather versus warm, moist weather. That is a fact, but we have no idea, since this is a brand new virus, whether this virus is going to follow that paradigm, and whether or not when it gets warm in the northern hemisphere, I live in Washington, it's, you know, we're just at the end of our winter and the beginning of spring, yeah. We cannot absolutely expect it's going to go down, although most of the time with other viruses, it does. So when someone in California says, you know, in general, viruses don't do very well, the fact is you've really got to be careful because you're dealing with a unique virus whose characteristics and behavior are unclear to us right now. All right, so... Uh, you talked a little bit about the projections, but a lot of people are asking, what should we expect over the coming weeks and months ahead? Um, how long should we, should we expect these kind of um, orders to be in place, and how, how long should we generally expect that to, to be on high alert for? Um, anything that you can give in terms of guidance for how, what people should expect in the weeks and, and, and months ahead, I think would be useful. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Mark. I mean, when, when the guidance and the guidelines and the suggestions were put out officially, from the government, it was said as a 15-day period. That does not mean it's only going to be 15 days. It means at the end of 15 days, we'll reevaluate and see if what we've done have had any noticeable impact and is it worth going mm -hmm. on. I would project personally, though it's always dangerous to make these kinds of projections, that we will go longer than two weeks. Because what if you look at what the virus has done in other countries, it doesn't just turn around over a week and a half or two. It tends to go up. The stronger your mitigation uh, uh, activities are, the less the impact will be. But I believe it likely will be more than just two weeks. And what do you think the likelihood is of another wave of this, either in the fall or, or, or later? So maybe we'll get this outbreak under control, but what do you, what do you, 
what are you worried about or what do you project and expect there? Okay. What I certainly would like to see is what happened with SARS. You remember back in 2002, the severe acute respiratory syndrome was SARS, which orig originated in the Guangdong province of China, had about 8,000 cases and about almost 800 deaths for a mortality of about 10%. When public health measures essentially suppressed it, it disappeared. It never came back. I'm afraid, Mark, that this virus is going to be a little bit different. Even though it's the same category of a coronavirus, it spreads too efficiently. So what I would think is likely, not inevitable, but likely that once we suppress it, and we will, we will get over this massive outbreak that's global. Once we get by it, it is conceivable and maybe likely that when we get to the next season, we may see another blip of this. But it would really be different, and I'll tell you why it's different. Because a certain percentage of the population will already have been immune, a bit of what we call herd immunity. We likely, by that time, will have tested a number of drugs. Hopefully, some of them will be effective in treatment. And as I mentioned, just a couple of days ago, we started a vaccine trial, and we hopefully, within a year to a year and a half, would have a vaccine. So although we're preparing yeah. and maybe expecting for it to come back, it's not going to come back in the same circumstances as it first came. Sure, and I want to get to the vaccine and, and other potential therapeutic strategies in, in a few minutes. But uh, before we get to that, just as you're thinking about, as uh, people start coming back to work and going back to offices and doing events again, um, you know, we're talking about potentially another wave in the fall or, or in um, a, a following season. But what is going to prevent it from just um, flaring up again as soon as people just go back to living uh, the way that they were before? Right. That's a good question. And, and I have to, as I always am, Mark, quite obvious that is that something that we need to feel as a possibility. So we're going to test that. In fact, even as you and I are speaking here, it's being tested because China went way up and they really locked down. I mean, if you want to talk about locking down, see what China did. I mean, they essentially shut down entire cities of 10 to 20 million people. And they did it, and the epidemic in their country went way down to practically nothing. There were less than a handful of new cases yesterday in China. Very, very few. What's happening now is the Chinese are reconnecting their society. They're coming out from hunkering down. They're coming out from locking down. If we see another blip in China, that will be ominous because that will mean that if you lock down and you prevent a big blast of infections, there's a chance you may have a rebound. So we're watching very closely what's going on in China now because they're getting back to normal. They're trying to get back to yeah. normal. That makes sense. So as part of the public health response, what has been the biggest issue with rolling out testing more broadly? And uh, what are the biggest barriers to expanding testing capacity going forward here? <clears throat> well, going forward, it's the good news. What's happened is you know, sobering and unfortunate in that the original system that was put into place for these kinds of responses was not really suited uh, uh, in the best possible way for broad blanket type testing that many, 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 many millions of people would want. It was a, a test that for certain situations worked well, which depended a lot on the CDC, the public health institutions in the state, and the physicians to ask for a test to go through that process. What it didn't do early on is something that as lessons learned, we clearly will do in the future and are doing now is to involve the private sector, the heavy hitting companies who do this for a living, who can give you high throughput testing in the tens of millions, as opposed to something that's a little bit more constrained. So looking forward, we will soon, maybe already, start to see an escalation 
of the capability of not only getting testers out there, but to be able to implement them. But that's a big lesson learned for next time. Yeah, so how far off do you think we are from having the testing capacity we need? Is that days, weeks, uh, more? Yeah, I mean, I know that our, our philanthropy at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, just announced today that we're partnering with Governor uh, Gavin Newsom and UCSF here in the Bay Area to, to increase capacity to more than 1,000 tests per day uh, over the next few days. But nationally, do you think we're, we're at um, that kind of scale in the next days or weeks, or how far off are we? I think we're gonna be heading towards that scale in the next several days, and certainly in the next couple of weeks, we have been promised by the companies that they'll be able to get the testing out there in a much higher volume than what we have in the past. That's not what I do, Mark, so I can't personally guarantee it, but from what I'm hearing and seeing, I think that the right people are in the right place doing that right now. All right, well, moving on to another thing that may not be what you personally oversee, but you certainly have uh, good visibility into this. A lot of people right now are worried about a spike in the number of patients overwhelming the hospital system and the, the medical system across the country. So how, how, how concerned are you about this and you know, a shortage of beds, ICUs, personal protective equipment like masks, um, ventilators? Um, how are we doing on addressing a potential shortfall uh, and what more should we be doing there? Yeah, so whenever you have, and it happens rarely, but whenever you have an outbreak that really is a full-blown explosive outbreak, even the best of preparations can get overwhelmed, particularly of the elements that you described. Respirators, ventilators, beds, ICU, things like that. Right now, we have a strategic national stockpile that has about 12,700 ventilators, tens and tens of millions of masks. It is a possibility that that could not be enough. And if it's a big, big outbreak, it won't be enough. So what's happened most recently over the last couple of days, a number of initiatives have occurred from the White House, from the president. One is to get the Department of Defense to be putting in a considerably larger number of ventilators to make available in case our strategic national stockpile is not enough. In addition, many, many millions of masks are gonna be available, the respirator masks, the N95s. So we could get overrun. We could have a paucity of beds. Two of the Navy ships, the Comfort and the Mercy, are being mobilized one being sent right now to the New York area because they're having a particular problem in New York in case they get overrun with lack of beds. Then we could put patients who would normally be in a regular bed in the hospital ship and putting people with coronavirus infection and COVID-19 disease in the regular hospital beds. So it's a possibility that we might have a problem, but I see a lot of activity trying to obviate that problem. And what do you think, that, is it a shortfall in all of those resources, beds, ICUs, uh, PPE, uh, ventilators, or are there some things that are more acute than others? Because I've heard you know, discussions around, you know, for example, should hotels be converting into uh, providing extra beds for, for hospitals? Um, how do you think about when the right time to do that is when you have an outbreak that's spreading quickly and it would probably take a couple right. weeks to stand up um, converting a hotel or something like that into a place that could be a medical facility? Well, well, one of the things we can do right now, and I think the hotel thing, I think we need to think about that seriously, Mark, and prepare for it, uh, including, you know, possibly universities uh, where people are not coming back to school. I think that's another possibility to consider. But one of the mm. things we could do right now, literally today, is to get hospitals throughout the country to delay and cancel elective surgical and medical admissions. Because once you let people in who have a procedure yeah, that, that they won't need right now, I mean, that's the way you chew up a lot of resources, beds, masks, personal protective equipment. Yeah. All right, so moving on from the what will hopefully be resolved in, in the next couple of weeks on the, the spike here, 
Um, let's talk about some of the longer term strategies for addressing this. Um, you mentioned the vaccine. There are conversations about other therapeutics. Um, maybe talk for a minute about where are we in the vaccine development? You just announced uh, the first trial um, for phase one to test the safety. Um, what's, what's the time frame for um, having something like that go through all of the different trials? Um, how could we expedite that? What should people expect on that? Okay, so if you look, I mean, to give the, your, our viewers and listeners a perspective, if this were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and it was for any vaccine that we wanted to make, you would say a vaccine from the time you start to the time it's approved to be safe and effective is several years, five, six, seven years. That's unacceptable for now. So what happened is that as soon as we got the sequence of the virus from the Chinese, we pulled it out of the public database and stuck the gene into a vaccine platform and worked on it literally within a day of when it came out. 65 days later, namely two days ago, we gave the first injection to a normal volunteer for a phase one trial to see if it's safe. That's the fastest that's ever been done. That's the good news. The challenging news is that even at that rocket speed, it's gonna take a few months to show that the initial safety is okay. Then you go into a phase two trial, which instead of involving 45 people, which we have in the phase one trial, it involves hundreds if not thousands of people. That will take another six to eight months to even know if it works. So at the fastest we can go, it's gonna take a year to a year and a half to know if we have a vaccine that we can use. So apropos of the question you asked me a moment ago, that if we cycle to another season, that's when a vaccine is gonna be very relevant. So one of the questions that I've heard from a number of people is, doing the safety trials obviously is, is incredibly important because you wanna make sure that you're not injecting people with something that, that could uh, be harmful. But once you have that, why not push harder on um, rolling it out more aggressively? Even if you don't know exactly how effective it is, um, you know, what's the public health rationale and, and thinking behind um, needing to prove that it's extremely effective before rolling out something that you know is, um, is, is safe? Okay, that's a good question. The initial safety uh, study, Mark, is to see if I inject it in the arm, does it have some sort of idiosyncratic or bad reaction? There's another element to safety, and that is if you vaccinate someone and they make an antibody response and then they get exposed and infected, does the response that you induce actually enhance the infection and make it worse. And the only way you'll know that is if you do an extended study, not in a normal volunteer who has no risk of infection, but in people who are out there in a risk situation. This would not be the first time, if it happened, that a vaccine that looked good in initial safety actually made people worse. There was the history of the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine in children, which paradoxically made the children worse. One of the HIV vaccines that we tested several years ago actually made individuals more likely to get infected. So you can't just go out there and give it unless you feel that in the field, when someone is getting infected and exposed, being vaccinated doesn't make them worse. That's why you gotta do a trial. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's important to, to get out there. Um, so with, with that context of, of these extended trial periods, even when you're doing heroic work to get these um, a vaccine candidate tested quickly, um, one of the strategies that I've heard that I'm personally most optimistic about and that um, you know, at our philanthropy, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where um, we're, we're trying to help out with is seeing if there are ways to test already approved um, compounds and drugs and therapeutics, things that have already gone through um, that, that cycle and have been proven to be safe um, and effective for, for fighting some disease uh, to see whether any of those uh, compounds or drugs could be effective for either uh, preventing or treating the symptoms of, of this coronavirus. So what do you yeah. think needs to happen in order to run through that process? I mean, I, I, I'm talking to a lot of scientists now who basically 
um, you know, all have hypotheses of compounds or, or things that they'd love to get tested. Um, what, do you, what would you like to see have happen there to prioritize which ones are the, are the most sure. optimistic? And, and what do you think about that strategy overall? Well, it's a great question because it's exactly happening, and I like the strategy. So there are a number of already approved drugs or drugs that have been developed but almost approved, not quite approved, that are now being looked at because of initial either in vitro or animal data work suggesting that they may be helpful. I'll give you some examples. There's a drug called remdesivir, which is a drug that was developed by Gilead as an antiviral. We tried it in Ebola. It didn't work as well as some of the other drugs, but it's there. What we're going to do now is there are clinical trials going on right now, both in China and in the United States, to see if it works. It's likely that one or more of these drugs, and there are several, are going to be out there to see an already developed drug if it can work. Another one is interesting. There's a lot of buzz on, on, the, on the Internet about this. And that is a drug called chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, which is a drug that's been approved for decades. Very cheap. Yeah, it's the old used malarial. malaria. Drug. Yeah, used in malaria and used in certain autoimmune diseases like lupus. There's some indication in the test tube that it might have some activity. The FDA said today that they are going to see if we can do some expanded use access, getting people who might want to use it off label namely since it's an approved drug. So your point is extremely well taken. One of the immediate ways for treatment is to look at drugs that you want to repurpose. While you're doing that, you want to start developing drugs de novo that are specifically targeted to the coronavirus itself. Those things will go on simultaneously. So are there any other, uh, aside from the vaccine for prevention, and then some of these other drugs that may be good for prevention, but also could be good at, for treatment. So reducing some of the symptoms, the intensity um, of the, the damage in the lungs, which could just reduce it from potentially being a, a, a very dangerous disease to something that could be more manageable. Um, what are the other long-term strategies that, that, that you see out there that, um, that you're optimistic about? Well, you know, I think the long-term strategy besides the drug, you have to go with trying to get a vaccine that's really effective. I mean, the history of viral diseases is that if we can get a vaccine, and, and I'm, I'm thinking in, in two channels, Mark, one, a vaccine for this specific coronavirus, but long-term, just think about it. Since 2002, we've had three outbreaks of coronaviruses. SARS, which I mentioned a moment ago, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and now this novel coronavirus. We should be and are and will be making a universal corona vaccine, which means you can make a vaccine that would be protective against any kind of coronavirus if you get it to make a response that's common to all of them. The same sort of thing that we've been doing for the past couple of years trying to develop a universal influenza vaccine. To me, that's the best long-term goal for this. Got it. So I want to take the last five or so minutes that we have um, to take some questions from the, the stream and the thread. I and mean, a lot of people have specific questions about um, you know, health, health information for themselves. So maybe we can, we can go through this um, pretty okay. quickly. Um, sure. Robert asked this question, if you test positive, uh, when is it okay to interact with others? Okay, that, that is a good point. Strictly speaking, if you are positive, you have the virus in you. And the way you determined positive was you got a nasal sw swab in your nasopharynx and you cultured the virus. The strict guideline is that in order to be able to feel safe in going out into society, you have to have two negative tests 24 hours apart. Namely, you're not shedding virus anymore so you can feel free to go out. That might change. It may be more flexible. When we get a better feel for what the real bracket of time of people shedding, you may be able to be more flexible than that. But that's the standard, gold standard yeah. now. So one of the questions I've seen asked by a lot of people is, you know, one of the maybe more positive uh, 
properties here is that it doesn't seem to have uh, severe effects on, on children under the age of nine, um, which, right. which is, is good news. Um, but then a lot of people wonder, okay, so if children don't seem like they're affected, are they carriers for this essentially? Or um, do they just basically just run through them like a common cold? And then once they're, they're done with it, then, um, then they're not spreading it either. I think that that's a good thing to clear up. Yeah, now we need to clear that up. And I think as we get more experience here and tap into the experience of our Chinese and European colleagues, we'll get the answer to that. For sure, what you said is factually correct. Children don't seem to get um, sick with this. The real question is, do they get infected? And from an infectious disease standpoint, I would predict that they do get infected, but they have such a mild illness that you don't notice that they're infected or they don't show any symptoms. The easiest way to find out is to do broad screening of children and figure out, are they really infected and asymptomatic or are they not getting infected? I tend to believe that they're getting infected, but something about their system the receptors in their lung, the nature of their immune response is making it that they are not getting symptoms. But then once they're, they're infected and the infection runs its course and they're done, um, then my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that this is important for people to see, um, is that there's no such thing as a long-term carrier, right? So if, if a child has it, then they, they get the infection and then um, and then they're done, and they're not infectious once they're done as well, just like everyone else. Is that, is that uh, your, your understanding, or is that an open right. question? It, well, it's an open question, but all the evidence in other situations indicate, particularly evidence from China, indicate that once you are infected, you resolve the infection, you resolve the virus, you are not infected anymore. So we don't anticipate that we're gonna have a problem where kids get infected, clear the infection, and then are a source to others. Even though it hasn't been formally proven, it's highly suggestive that that's not gonna be the case. Yeah, and a similar question that I, uh, that I have here from Bladar is, can you get reinfected by the coronavirus if you've already had it? Again, that hasn't been formally tested, but it is every reason to believe that this virus, when it comes to an immune response and long-term immunity, that it's not acting any different from any other virus. So I would project that once you're infected and you recover, that if you get exposed to this exact virus, you will not get reinfected. Remember, there are many different kinds of coronaviruses, but the one that infected you, you should be protected against. All right, well, I, I wanna uh, be conscious of our time. Is there anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you wanna uh, make sure that we address here? You know, I, I think we spoke about it uh, indirectly, Mark, but I would like to make a plea to the young individuals who are, who are watching the people, you know, adolescents, teenagers, people in their 20s and 30s, who we've mentioned and pointed out are so much less likely to not get a serious consequence of infection, to please understand that you will play a major role in ultimately containing this infection by not being careless and avoiding and not listening to the recommendations of physical separation. Please, because you are an important part of this whole process. Great, and is there, as a closing thought, is there any uh, source of information that you would point people too. I mean, a lot of the questions that I've gotten here are, you know, what's the best source of information? There's a lot of conflicting information out there. What, what do you think people should, should go look at and, and rely on to get information on this going forward? Yeah, there's two websites that overlap with each other. You can access one from the other. One is cdc.gov, but if you want to directly go to coronavirus information, just dial in coronavirus.gov. Great. And Facebook has just launched the Coronavirus Information Center, which we're putting at the top of the app and, um, and at the top of the menu for, for the next uh, period while the situation is going on, where we're aggregating a lot of um, information from trusted health authorities 
uh, like the CDC and WHO and local governments as well. So you can check that out too. All right, Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for, for joining me for this. It's, it's really important that people get a chance to hear from you. And I just want to thank you and, and all, of, um, all, all of the folks on your team and all of the medical workers um, and health workers on the front lines who are fighting this, who are all doing um, heroic work. And um, uh, I, I think I, I um, can say this for a lot of people, but um, I'm extremely grateful for everything that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. It was a pleasure being with you. You too. Good luck. Thank you.